So thank you very much, Rob, um, for talking with us um, today. We've been travelling around the country a lot at the moment, and we've had lots of questions from people who want to know more about the changes you're making to improve the experience of participants as their families as they move through the scheme. People have heard a lot that some changes are happening, but they don't really know what they are and what it's going to mean for them. So what we thought we would do here today is bring some of their questions to you um, and you can let people know um, what the changes are that you're doing, what you're trying to achieve and what it's going to mean for, for people on the ground. So thank you very much um, for your time. You're welcome. Today. You're welcome, Kirsten. It's great to be here. Yeah. So before we get on to the changes, can you just explain a little bit about what is the participant pathway? Sure, Kirsten. Uh, when we refer to the pathway, we're really referring to the experience that people with disability, family members and carers and providers generally have at all stages in dealing with the National Disability Insurance Scheme, predominantly with the agency itself. Um, it starts from really getting to know about the scheme itself and the information sessions that are held across states and territories and locations, or the information that is on our website. Uh, at a point in time when a person with disability is considering having access made to enter the scheme, that's the next stage in the journey. Uh, if they're successful in that process and obviously meet the eligibility criteria, then we start a process around planning. And that planning starts with getting to understand the participant, their goals and their objectives. Uh, when we have a better understanding of that and their disability type and their needs, we develop a plan that really helps them support delivery on their objectives and goals. Right, so the pathway really is the journey that people go on as they move into the scheme and work their way, work their way very through. Very much so, very okay. much so. All right, so um, you've been trialling a new pathway in a couple of areas um, in, in Victoria. Can you tell us what changes have you made and how is the pilot going? Yeah, we had some uh, feedback from participants last year really about you know, what was working well and what wasn't working as well in terms of the experience with the scheme. Uh, so we held a number of sessions with participants, providers, carers, family members, sectors, representatives and staff and local area coordinators to understand you know, how can we really make this better for everybody involved. Uh, so we designed what we call the new participant pathway and we went and trialled that in three locations in Victoria. Uh, over a period of six to eight months, we had over a thousand participants come through that pathway and that new journey, as you alluded to, um, but really focusing more on the planning phases of uh, the pathway. So it started with uh, participants who were already eligible for the scheme, and the first part of that was very much about face-to-face -face conversation, generally with local area coordinators, about preparing for the plan. So that was the first part of what we tested, is really trying to address any anxiety or any concerns about the whole thing relating to the scheme. And so that pre-planning was a face-to-face -face conversation, understanding their goals, any questions they had. Once we gathered that information, the next part of the pathway was actually start to develop what the plan would look like. And that generally had both the local area coordinator and the planner from the agency sit down with the participant, their carer or nominee, uh, and put in place the plan. And then post that conversation, a follow-up meeting, generally again with the local area coordinator, which was about uh, how do we actually put that plan into practice. Because we had a lot of feedback that once participants got the plan, they really didn't know how to move forward to the next steps. So those were the three parts of the planning process we tested. Uh, so it was very much about face-to-face -face conversations. Over 80% of participants chose to have those conversations in face-to-face. -face. Some chose not to, and that's fine, the participant gets the choice. Uh, the second insight we really took was the time from the plan approval to putting the plan in practice and starting to implement and use their funds was a lot shorter than in other areas of Australia. So that gave us a good sense of people actually understood the plan and what to do next. Uh, and the other great insight for us was really about participants telling us they understood the plan. We've had a lot of feedback from participants that you know they had a planning conversation, they've received this plan, it's very confusing, I can't remember how we got to that point. Mm -hmm. So what we tested in this pilot was a simplified plan document, a small number of pages. It was designed by a participant reference group and we got some great feedback that over 94% of participants could understand the plan. That's great. 
Um, so you've had a chance to test these and you've learnt from them. Have yes. you made you made some changes based on those? How are you going to roll that um, out around the country? Yeah, so uh, we've taken lots of insights from that pilot. Uh, the first thing is simplified documentation, and so we created some easy English booklets uh, for participants, three booklets to really understand the scheme process and the pathway and the journey that you alluded to. And so we've recently made those available to all participants and people understanding the scheme. Uh, we've also started to develop those in other languages. We've had some feedback that's really important to get that right, as well as braille versions. So that was the first thing that we took out of the pilot, which is simple documentation and information. Uh, the second part of it is designing the plan, which is much easier to understand. Uh, so that will be going live in November, and so there's some systems changes to make that a lot easier for participant. Putting those to the side, what we've taken out of it is training up our planners and local area coordinators so they work together on having those three participant planning conversations. And then over the next three to four months, we will train planners and local area coordinators across the rest of Australia. All right, so if participants go on the website, they can see there will be a schedule of when it's rolling out, so they'll know when the changes will happen in the area that they live in? So we haven't put forward all the okay. locations. We're still working through with the states and territories of what that rollout looks like. Okay. We should have that available soon. Okay. There is still some sequencing to get right. Um, for instance, in Northern Territory, making sure we do the training in the wet season when they can't get out yep. to see participants. So we're finalising that, but we should have that available and communicated. We're advising all of our local area coordinators, so if participants contact their local area coordinators, they should understand when it's coming to their region. Okay, that's great. All right. Um, we've also heard that you're developing tailored pathways for particular groups of people, like people who have particular complex needs or people who come from a culturally or linguistically diverse background. Can you tell us where that work is up to and what that will mean for people on the ground? Yeah, I mean, one of the uh, brilliant things about the process we've been through is getting the insights from participants and carers and family members about the unique needs for different people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we designed the pathway originally, you know, we thought it was going to be a very similar approach to uh, how we delivered that. We've certainly taken insights that there are very different needs that we need to tailor for. It starts with children, so we have an early childhood, early investment approach for children from the day they're born up to six years old. And so our pathway for them is slightly different to the standard pathway. We then have also learned that there are unique needs for different people and so uh, one of the elements we took out through the insights and the workshops that we had with participants and providers, carers and family members was there are participants with complex service needs, you know, interactions with the justice systems and other departments of government. So we've created a new unit called Complex uh, Service Support and that's really to help participants in those difficult situations and getting the right planners to support them. We've also recently announced a pathway stream for psychosocial disability and we've been working with Mental Health Australia and starting to design what that looks like. And over and above that, what we've realised is there's enhancements for different situations. If you're in regional and very remote areas, we recognise the challenges to participants in those areas. How do they get access to supports in thin markets? They might be quite distant from other support areas. So we're starting to design pathways that support the unique needs of those participants. Also over and above that is people with cultural and linguistic differences and how do we make sure that our planners are culturally aware of those unique needs our information that we provide them is appropriate. We provide translating services when they need them. So we're starting to design service enhancements for participants with those needs, and as well as Indigenous and uh, Torres Strait Island backgrounds, recognising what their unique needs are and also how different they are across the country in terms of their own cultural backgrounds. So we've created a new unit within the agency to purely start to look at how we support their needs. So we're continuing enhancing uh, our pathways for different participants' needs, making sure that we really understand what's important for them and how do we deliver the right outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like you're still working on that. We won't necessarily see some of those changes on the ground soon. 
You'll start to see some okay. of those things uh, very soon. So if we pick the complex service support needs, mm -hmm. uh, we're testing that in Victoria and New South Wales over the coming months. We're recruiting specialised planners for those participants, creating what we call portfolios of participants to be looked after by those specialist planners. Uh, in terms of psychosocial disability, we've got a rollout schedule over the next three months, starting with South Australia and Tasmania, testing it out again. We want to make sure that we see what we learn and then roll that out once we've got that right. In terms of areas like cultural and linguistic differences, uh, we're creating the booklets in different languages. We're also doing training for planners to understand that. So I think what participants will start to see over the coming months is a lot more about what we're doing in these areas and hearing about it and testing those things to see how we get them right. That's great. Um, we've been holding um, forums all across Australia um, at the moment. And one of the fantastic things that happens at the forums is that we've been asking people what changes they would like to see um, uh, that would really improve experience and outcomes for participants uh, and, their, and their families. Um, and while we've heard hundreds of different things all around the country, um, the ideas that people have had can really be sort of grouped into three basic categories. And the first category is really around training. People with disability and their families really want to see um, that the local area coordinators and the planners that they deal with um, have a better training and more experience um, uh, with disability in general, but within particular kinds of disability. And we've heard that you're making some changes about training for staff. So could you tell us a little bit about more about that? Yeah, thanks Kirsten. And it's great to get the feedback uh, around what is really important to participants and what they're hearing and seeing. It really mm. helps us inform what we need to put mm. our focus and attention on. And training is certainly one of those consistent messages that we've had. We're trying to balance two things. Firstly is growing the agency and uh, certainly over the next 12 months we're bringing over, over 750 new planners into the agency. We've been doing a lot of work around what we call a success profile of a planner, what's the background, the skills that they need, the soft skills as well as the technical skills to create what a great planner would look like. Uh, and so we're using that to base what the training is that's required for planners. Uh, for the new pathways, starting to roll out in Western Australia, we've started uh, training planners in the areas that we really focus our attention on. Uh, greater cultural awareness, greater knowledge of disability types is really core to everybody's uh, baseline training. Uh, and we've also recognised that we previously had an induction program which was just purely face-to-face -face classroom training. What we've learned is very much is some in-house training and then put them back into the field, spend some time with participants and bring them back. What have they learned? What's working? What's not working? So we have a six-week program uh, for all new starters around understanding disability types as well as obviously cultural awareness. That's the first part of it. The second is really moving them to much more softer skills, really understanding how to drive outcomes and deliver outcomes for participants, which the scheme's all about. So over the next uh, six months, we'll be training over 6,000 people, as I said earlier. It's a, it's a big endeavor for us. Uh, we've been working with different organizations to make sure that we develop the right training that is appropriate for different planners and different disability types. And then also as we start to build specialisation within the agency, so those planners with allied health backgrounds to focus on certain participants, those that actually have a good understanding of children, uh, making sure that the bespoke training for them is right. Uh, so that's core to what we're trying to do. We also recognise we're not always going to get it right and we look forward to getting feedback, ongoing feedback about what's working, what's not. And then over and above the baseline training is then the training that's required for different planners and local area coordinators in different parts of Australia, whether that is around much more cultural awareness about working in regional remote areas and some of the situations they have to deal with there as well. That's great. Um, people tell us at the forums that they find NDIS processes very complicated, very confusing, quite difficult uh, to navigate. Um, they want to see simpler processes, quicker processes, things that they um, uh, would find easy to navigate. And they also want more help 
as they move through the scheme. You mentioned that you're making some changes to the way that the NDIA communicates out with participants and their, and their families. Can you tell us a little bit more about those changes and what that will mean for people on the ground? Yeah, thanks Kirsten, and, and we totally agree that we need to make uh, the scheme and the processes and the journey for all participants and people working through it a lot easier, even for our own staff. Uh, so the pathway has been a great basis for us to really go back and have a look at our information that we have, the information that our planners use, that our local area coordinators use, and how do we simplify that? How do we make that easy to understand uh, in simpler language as well? Uh, so there's guidelines, work and practice guides for our people that needs to continue to be improved and simplified. And then by doing that, we feel that we start to get the language better in terms of how we communicate with participants and people outside of the agency. So that's the first part. The second is, as I alluded to earlier, is we're making some changes to our website um, and that'll have much easier navigation for participants and people going on the website and also the ability to have access on mobile phones and other devices a lot easier. Uh, so that's the second part of what we're doing. Thirdly is we're working through how do we provide ongoing communication to people about the scheme and that's through multi-channel so it's not just the website, it's also thinking about webinars and communicating to participants about certain insights about the scheme and changes coming up. And then finally we've certainly heard from participants is they want to go to one person. You know, they call the contact centre one day, they call again the next day, it's a different person, they call the local area coordinator, sometimes they can't get through. So the pathway is all about giving participants, family members and carers a consistent point of contact. That's the first part of what we're testing in Western Australia, where participants will have the contact details for the local area coordinator who is their main point of contact, who can help navigate and address any issues they have and think about any questions they may need to get solved for them. Mm. Um, people very much want more help to navigate the scheme. They want more help before they come into the scheme to get ready. And then once they're in, they need more help moving through. And perhaps most importantly, when they do get their plan, getting that plan into action. Yeah. Um, they want processes to be simpler and quicker. Um, things like that we've heard in the forums is that people would really like to see a draft of their plan before it is submitted so they have a chance to catch um, any mistakes um, before it uh, goes any further. The other thing that people um, also see is that they um, uh, are finding yearly reviews really stressful and if things haven't changed they're wondering why they need to come in to have a review when, when things are pretty much the same as they were kind of a year ago. So we've heard that there's some changes in the wind. Can you tell us a little bit about those and whether they're going to address those problems? Yeah, thanks Kirsten. Look, there are a couple of questions you, yeah. you posed there. So let me start with the first one, which is about the navigation process. As uh, said earlier, I think the pathway in part is really trying to address that with over time participants having that single consistent point of contact being the local area coordinator and the planner uh, and understanding who to go to. And that hopefully helps them navigate through that process. The second uh, point to your question was about the draft plan. So when I first arrived, I'd heard a lot about this. And uh, when we dug into this, I think it stemmed from two core issues. The first one was they went straight, participants went straight into a planning conversation and they hadn't had enough time to prepare for it. And then when they received the plan uh, document, you know, they couldn't reconcile with potentially what was on their mind and they may have missed some things that they weren't given enough time to prepare for. And the last part was the plan document's very confusing. So the pilot for us was to try to think about the root causes of those issues. And by having more time in the planning process for a pre-planning conversation, and then the planning discussion. The planning discussions allow the plan and the local area coordinators to walk through the plan before it's approved. And so if there are some differences, they can make them on the spot. And we found through the pilots that over 90% of the plans were approved on the spot because the participant was very comfortable that it captured everything they wanted. And the final part to that was a simplified plan document. When they then read through it, it was very easy to actually understand what they had in their plan and how to use it. So we're hoping that really alleviates the concerns that participants had and uh, if they have any issues with it, then they can still obviously say we want to make some changes to it. 
Uh, the final question you had was about the duration of the plans, and uh, that's a really good insight that uh, been raised, and we've heard it a few times. We've been testing in two areas more recently, Coffs Harbour and Toowoomba, looking at participants who have been in the scheme for a year to say what is the right duration for a plan. Because as you alluded to, there are some participants who are very comfortable, circumstances are unlikely to change for a period of time. And so what we've been testing is putting plan durations longer than generally 12 months, which uh, the scheme and the Act supports, and uh, we certainly support. And we're finding now about 40% of participants are uh, erring on the side of taking a much longer plan, uh, two to three years, um, and hopefully that gives them more comfort that they don't have to go through that process if they don't want to. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, if circumstances change, then obviously we can have a plan review at any point in time. Yeah. And so um, now that you've had a chance to look at that in two areas, do you have any plans for rolling that out more broadly? We do. We've had a project team uh, who spent a bit of time together over the last couple of weeks taking the insights out of those mm -hmm. locations of what's worked, what hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. And over the next couple of months, we're putting some practice guides in place for our planners uh, and advising our local area coordinators of how to actually have those conversations which are the profiles of participants? It makes sense to have shorter plans. Children, for instance, circumstances change a lot more frequently, whereas for which participants it makes sense actually to encourage them to think about a longer plan. Mm -hmm. And so we hopefully have start to see that actually put better into practice. We also recognise that for the first plan, participants might have a little bit more anxiety and say, I'm not sure that two or three years is right. I want to see how it goes first and whether it's right. And so we feel probably after that first plan, the second plan is generally the right time to think about extensions. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for your time um, here today. We really appreciate the chance to ask you the questions that we've been asked all around the country. We hope that we can make this a regular thing. We get lots of feedback through every Australian Council and we'd like a chance um, to bring it to you um, and perhaps next time we can go out to our every Australian Council community and, and let them know that we're talking to you and, and, and ask them what it is that what are the burning issues that they'd like us to ask you. So we hope that we can do that next time. Certainly. Uh, Kirsten, it's been great being here. Really appreciate it. We look forward to hearing more about the feedback of today's video and uh, certainly any opportunities that arise that I can come out and speak to participants directly or be more involved. Look forward to it. All right. That's great. Thank you.